Usually the video is given a lot of thought and a lot of budget, and we buy thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of lenses and such. And then audio is like the 22nd thing on the list, and we don't think about it until it's like, well, you know, that was a great video, but the audio didn't, didn't come out so hot. Um, this is where AVX comes in and takes away all that difficulty for you. This is interesting. It's kind of fuzzy because I blew it up pretty big. But if you look here, this is a napkin at some restaurant, probably in Germany, uh, that the, one of the engineers drew onto the concept of AVX when it wasn't even a product yet. It was just a thought. And you can see here that they're looking at a very small, tiny type uh, receiver with an XLR, which swivels. So if you have a jack pack or something in the way, the AVX can work around that. It swivels about 300 degrees. And uh, they're looking at a little status LED, a switch, and external power. And uh, it's kind of hard to see, but this says EK, uh, which is uh, like Infanger Kleine, which is a receiver in, in German. Uh, and this is uh, what we're looking at here. Pretty cool. There it is, live on the video. And yes, we have some here we'll, we'll go into, into depth. Uh, but as you see, the AVX receiver is extremely small. It has a built-in XLR connector on it. Uh, basically one button for check and one button for pair. This is also the power button. That's it. Uh, it has a lithium ion rechargeable battery and it's about the size of a primatine mist inhaler or similar. Uh, it's very tiny. Uh, you plug it right in and it connects directly to the uh, camera's XLR jack. Now it also ships with the eighth inch or 3.5 millimeter if you want to use it with your DSLR and we'll show you all those accessories in a minute. So we relax. Why? Because everything's automatic. There's only one setting on the AVX besides pairing it that you need to worry about, which is the audio output level. Everything else is taken care of for you. Frequencies, power adjustment, um, all that stuff is automatic. There's no dialing or scanning for frequencies. You basically turn it on, and it works. It's a lot like pairing a Bluetooth headset, except it's not Bluetooth. AVX runs in the 1.9 gigahertz range, which is the decked frequencies. And uh, back maybe 10, 15 years ago, we saw a lot of portable Panasonic or VTech phones in your house that use decked frequencies. But now since everybody has a cell phone and no longer uses that, uh, we, those frequencies have opened up. And we can use wireless in these same frequencies uh, to great effect. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a couple key marketing spin, and I'll try to decode it for you and what that, that all means. So wireless link protection with adaptive high-powered transmission. Adaptive high-powered transmission means that the system's smart enough where instead of just a traditional transmitter communicating back to a receiver, it's a two-way communication. Um, in the traditional wireless sense, uh, the person wearing the mic, like I'm wearing right now, is a one-way transmission, and that's it. Here, this can talk to the receiver, and the receiver can talk to the transmitter. Uh, so when we say transmitter, it's actually a transceiver, and it does both things. It can tell us information like, hey, uh, I sent you that signal. How, how good was it? And the receiver is like, well, it was all right, but it could be a little stronger. And it's like, all right, well, I'll, I'll turn my power up. And OK, let's try that. And it's doing this back and forth kind of, hey, can you hear me now type of deal? And that's where we talk about the adaptive high power transmission. because. Uh, in the 1.9 gigahertz, uh, we have the ability to go up to 250 milliwatt, which is really cool. Um, now, if we did 250 milliwatt or a quarter of a watt all the time, our battery life would be like this. So we want to use just enough to make sure we hear and everything is good, but without using it all the time so we eat up all that battery. It also has intelligent channel backup. This is a fancy marketing spin for telling you that it actually broadcasts and receives on two different frequencies. So the same transmission from somebody's voice is on one channel as it is another channel. So if that channel becomes compromised due to interference or something in the area, it automatically has a backup already and it'll just go over. And when it finds out that that first signal had a problem, it's going to blacklist it and say, hey, don't use this frequency, guys. Um, it's actually really interesting because the first AVX that you turn on in an area it becomes the traffic control for all the rest of AVXs. So if you have one, that's great. But you know, we hope you buy like five or six. And then um, if you have more than one, the first one tells the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth one, you know, hey, this frequency is good. This guy's using this frequency. Don't use this frequency. And it's doing this very coordinated frequency hopping all behind the scenes. Like you're, you don't have to think about it. Um, in fact, it's so intelligent that the first one you turn on becomes that air traffic controller master, 
If that one goes offline for whatever reason, or breaks, or you know falls in the water, or the battery runs out, it automatically de designates a secondary backup, and that backup then takes over the role and says, hey, now you be my backup, and I'll do the handing out of frequencies. Oh, don't use this frequency because it's bad. All you have to do is make sure you got two green lights and it's doing all this behind the scenes. So this is a welcome change for videographers that are on the run and you're doing your show and you're like, the last thing you want to think about is setting up all your lights and your tripod and your lab and did I get the right lab? Is it on? Is mute on? Is, you know, do I have to scan for frequencies? Is that one going to be good? Did I set the gain level right? It does it all for you and you have to do nothing. It's, it's pretty magical actually. So that brings us right to automatic channel management and no manual frequency coordination. Turn it on, two green lights, everything's great. Okay, this is another cool part, uh, phantom power controlled. This means that when I plug the receiver into a camera or another XLR port that has the phantom power option, like a mixing console or a little uh, a mixer or something like that, when it senses phantom power, it turns on the receiver. And when the phantom power goes off, it turns off the receiver. Now, granted, phantom power is a very weak type of milliamps. It doesn't have a lot of charging capacity, so we can't run the receiver off phantom power uh, due to constraints in the phantom power design. But it can actually turn on and off. Why is this important? Well, if I'm doing a shoot on and off all day, I can leave this stuck into my camera. When I turn my camera on, the receiver comes on with the camera. I do my shooting, everything's cool. Turn the camera off, phantom power goes off, the receiver goes quiet and saves the battery. So now I can make the battery last even longer when I'm not using it. One less thing to remember, hey, did I turn off that battery? Oh, geez, I put it in my camera bag and I left it on. So it does all that and that's great. If it doesn't have phantom power, say you're using it with a DSLR or other type of 3.5 millimeter device, then of course you can manually turn it on and off. It does have intelligent things too, where if it doesn't see a transmitter in a couple minutes, it'll turn itself off to save battery power and such. So they've tried to thought of all the different, um, different ways to save battery life and make it work better for you. The uh, automatic sensitivity adjustment uh, means there's no need for manual setting. Now this is a name for auto gain and auto gain usually gets a bad rap um, because of uh, some of its limitations in the, in the past. Um, auto gain is known for not having good limiting or like loud sound or transient noise capability where it can kind of get weird. Auto gain in the past has also been known for during quiet passages, the ground, or the, the ground floor noise comes up, the noise floor comes up and you hear a lot of hissing because uh, it's like, oh, I don't think I hear anything, I should keep up and up the level. Well, we've hired an excellent team of engineers have a proprietary patent on this really awesome kind of next generation auto gain software, and that's what's in the AVX. It works extremely well, so well in fact that on the transmitter, there is really just a power switch and a pair button. That's it, there's no setting. So <laughs> if I give this to somebody that's uh, out in the field or whatever, here it is, just use it. it that's, it's as easy as that, so. That is a, a kind of a, a new development, and I, I know you may not believe me that it works really well, but you know, you'll, you'll see it, it does work actually phenomenally well. Pretty sweet. The same guys that do the algorithms for these do like uh, these very high-level plugins, and they can remove unwanted artifacts almost to the point where it's undetectable that these artifacts were removed from the recording, like forensic uh, analysis of audio and such. I was having dinner with them the other night. It was, it was pretty, pretty amazing. <coughs> So perfect fit, yeah, it has an ultra compact receiver. Yes, it's extremely small. It's the smallest one on the market. If you look at it, you're like, this is it, really? It, it's, that, it's that small. We have a direct XLR connection to the camcorder and it ships with the adapter so you can mount it on the hot shoe or the cold shoe of the camera. All this is in the box. You don't make you have to buy anything extra. It comes right in there. It's also a safe investment. Um, we're talking about losing the 600 megahertz next year. We don't really know what's gonna happen except we know that something's gonna happen. Uh, a lot of my day job when I'm not doing educational things is doing frequency coordination and uh, at high profile events and helping out at like the Grammys or 30 Rock and, and things of that nature. Um, and everybody's really freaking out about what's happening with the 600 megahertz. Uh, we're unsure to the extent if we're gonna lose the entire range and so forth, but we know something's gonna happen. Uh, the FCC is doing an auction and uh, in March we'll know exactly what it is, how much we're losing, what will become illegal, and when we have to be out of it. Most likely it'll be a year from March 2016 where we'll have to exit the frequency range if you own any 600 megahertz devices. But what I do know is that the 1.9 gigahertz 
no problem. Um, it's going to be unaffected. And this is one of those products that <clears throat> it's kind of a niche product that not a lot of things use in that frequency range. So uh, it's much better, in my opinion, than like a 2.4 gigahertz system, which everybody has. Um, 2.4 is a good thing. Uh, it's easy and license free, but there are limitations, especially with all the other things using 2.4. Uh, you have Wi-Fi routers and security cameras and baby monitors and garage door openers and drones that fly around and all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, 2.4 is like the wild, wild west. Uh, 1.9 is not very well used for this audio application and hence uh, while it will be protected. It also has high security. If you do any camera work for the government or others that are very you know, secret and have to keep their data safe, uh, not only just the government, but uh, we do a lot of things with banks. And like Charlotte, North Carolina, there's like banks right next to each other, and Wells Fargo and Bank of America. And while they're telling all their super secret banker stories, you know, they don't want the competition across the street with the same device listening in and hearing what's going on. So uh, AES-256 is, uh, is in, built right in. We power the whole deal with the uh, lithium ion batteries, which come with it. It's not like you have to buy anything additional. Um, what's really cool about these batteries is that there's not a special charger. The battery itself has a micro USB port in it. And you can use any micro USB charger you have. You probably have a whole drawer full, like Android devices or little USB powered whatever, drone helicopters, you name it. As long as you plug it into a 500 milliamp or better or a USB port on a computer, it'll charge these batteries. Uh, this also makes it pretty cool out in the field because if you're doing like an extended runtime type of deal and you need a like day's worth of runtime, you can get yourself a, one of those big battery banks and charge it up ahead of time and then use that to power this continually. Uh, the transmitter itself has about 15 hours of runtime, which is excellent. Uh, most have eight. And the uh, receiver has four hours, four to five hours. Now keep in mind the receiver does the auto power saving, so that's four to five hours of continuous shooting, which is probably on par with your camera's battery. Uh, if you have an elaborate camera set up, an Anton Bauer battery pack that has a USB powered out or a five volt out, you can use that to power the receiver indefinitely as long as your camera rig is alive. So uh, they thought of those type of things, and when you're out in the field, it's, it's going to be easy to use, definitely. So some of the boring tech specs and whatnot, um, yes, it has awesome frequency response because it is a digital system. We're 20 to 20,000. Um, excellent dynamic range and low distortion, uh, great signal to noise ratio. Uh, in the US, we're using in the 1.9 gigahertz or 1920 to 1930 megahertz. So we're not affected by TV. We're not affected by Wi-Fi. It's in the middle of those type of ranges. Um, it uses a proprietary transmission method um, back and forth with antenna diversity on two different channels. It uh, has a low latency of, of 19 milliseconds, uh, which is a little bit over a frame, about a frame and a half at, at 60 frames per second, and um, works really well. The EKP, or the, the uh, receiver part, um, again, we talked about all these features here. Uh, rechargeable battery and you know greater than four hour time and the automatic on and off XLR built right in and so forth. Um, the SKM, uh, the handheld that comes with it is called an SKM. The uh, AVX SKM actually ships with an omnidirectional capsule, which is kind of a new thing for us. Uh, since this is designed as a video system, um, we're not really worried about feedback because we're not amplifying it through speakers, typically. I mean, you could. Um, so we ship it, if you buy the handheld portion, with an omni capsule. Because we all know, you know, when you're doing a shoot and somebody, you give a mic that's never used a mic before, you know, starts like here, and then it starts going like this, or, you know, you're talking or giving the toast at the wedding, the same thing, they're like, blah, 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 and they're not talking into the microphone like you should be holding a microphone. Uh, so the omnidirectional helps alleviate some of those concerns. Talked about most of this, uh, up to 250 milliwatt RF output power. Um, a good question is, OK, that's all great, but how far does it go? Uh, the range of the system on paper is about 150 feet. Um, now, I've done line of sight tests up to 500 feet, um, but what they're kind of getting a happy medium between you know, how the extreme distance of short and long will go. Of course, it'll be better inside with more reflections that the RF can bounce off of, and uh, outside it's going to want a, more of a line of sight. But 150 feet in front of a camera is pretty good for most applications when you're normally going to be within 20 feet of the camera, no problem. Um, so that's, that's usually not an issue. There's different variants, but um, 
this is uh, we did a training at B and H, and this came up a little bit because there are foreign customers, and you, you may be one of them, you know, taking it back to your country. But uh, the 1920 to 1930 megahertz is the variant we sell in the U.S. This is what we're allowed to sell in the decked frequency range here. Um, this 10 megahertz allows us use of up to eight systems simultaneously and safely. Uh, so we can use eight AVXs in the same room at the same time with no problem. But um, beware if you're going to take it overseas or to other countries that have restrictions that there are different frequency ranges for different countries. And some countries don't allow it at all, like the China and the Philippines. They just have no licensing or it's banned for whatever reason. Um, so um, something to, to be aware, at, aware of. But 1.9 gigahertz, yes, green lights, it works. It's going to be great. This is all uh, a bunch of stuff that I brought that was the light stuff uh, to, to talk about different ways that I've thrown these devices onto rigs and sent them out and done things with them. And it's a little apropos to say this is the light stuff because I packed all this into one shoulder bag and uh, because it's a very wonky table, but uh, because now this is so small that it doesn't matter. So I've actually flown this camera on Ronins and things of that nature, and all of a sudden I have an option that doesn't impact weight or balance at all to put audio onto it, which I never did. I was always doing second system audio. That was kind of nice. Then realizing that with just a small box like this, um, or Beach Tech has an even smaller one, I think, that would merge two, I can put this on my camera with two of these little receivers and it still almost doesn't change the weight of the camera at all. That was amazing. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. I said my biggest fear was that there were no buttons. And, and, and I don't care about the handheld so much, but on the, the belt pack. So I love the battery pack. To me, lithium ion battery packs for wireless are way overdue. They're, they're there's no reason not to. Um, but there's a place to plug the mic in, and there's a mute switch. And there's a power switch on the side and a pair button. And I said, how, how can this handle all the different ways I use it? So you're talking about distance. I do some shooting where I put uh, a microphone in. DPA has some uh, mics that I use on a boundary, where they go into a flat disc that sits on a stage edge because I want to do B-roll at a, a theater, theater performance. And I'll put this down, and then I'm picking up things that are 10, 12, 20 feet away, maybe more. And then other times I'm putting it on me, and I'm wearing it close mic'd and uh, doing things in a loud environment. Where's my adjustment at the pack? But that's always been the problem, too, right? How many of us are sending people out that may not know enough about audio? I know I do. I have people that work for me that are not audio specialists. They're very good camera people, and they know how to turn on a system. But as soon as they walk into an environment where something goes wrong, there's a problem. Uh, they realize, I can't put the mic on one person because I've got two I have to do. So now I have to do distance miking. But now the, the sensitivity on the pack is wrong, things like that. So that gets people tripped up a lot. But auto gain is terrible. I, I don't shoot with Canon DSLRs anymore, partly because of that situation, uh, because you can't have auto gain. So I didn't really believe this was going to work for me at all. What I can tell you now, <laughs> having tested it, is that I can distance mic or I can close mic and just adjust the AF out on the receiver to hit the level on the camera that I want, all right? And it depends on the camera. On, on a Canon DSLR, I know I want that volume pot to be pot, the, the digital gain to be up like one click because they're super noisy on the front end. So I know I'm gonna, I'm gonna gain this up to the four, the four output level and I'm gonna get a lot of gain going into the camera. On this camera, I'm going to go on these pots about almost halfway up, and that's going to be a really quiet place for this camera to record, and I'm going to make up the distance here, difference here with one adjustment. There's one gain stage, and I can tell anybody how to set up that mic, and it works. Um, 
And that's it. I don't have to say anything else. I could leave now because it works. Uh, there is no pumping. There is no volume raising or lowering perceived. There is nothing happening here that I can tell you is happening. What I did today in preparation for this was to very quickly and roughly, about a half hour before I left, uh, sit down with an evolution system and this system, put two low sensitivity mics on, so worst case scenario, gained them both up, uh, going into the camera exactly the same, hit the same level, and said, I expect to hear a lot of background noise on this. And I'll play the video clip. I don't know if we're going to really um, be able to tell here. I'll let you, I'll let you do that. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to tell anything. What I can tell you is sitting there listening in the monitors, the two systems sounded the same. And to me, that was like shocking, because this system does all of its own configuration. On the EW100 uh, system, I set the input oh, sensitivity. Okay. Hello? <laughs> Is that you? Yep. Uh, I set the input sensitivity manually on the transmitter. I set the AF out on the receiver. I set the pot on the camera. And I made all those choices to specifically have as little background noise as possible in that system. On this system, I set the pot on the camera to the quietest point I wanted to, I knew the camera could do. I turned on the transmitter with the mic, same mic plugged into it, and I hit the uh, button, one button, a couple of times to get that level. This is what happened. And the new AVX packs with two matching elements and trying to determine when properly set up, the G2 will have a specific input sensitivity and will not change. And one of the questions is, what does the AVX system do if there's no way to set any kind of input sensitivity? I'm using two reduced sensitivity DPA uh, 4061s. I had to increase the output from the AF out on the receiver of the AVX system uh, up to, are we at four? Four, yeah. At four, and it seems to be giving us good level. I'm at a negative 10 sensitivity on the pack on the G2, and uh, AF out level from plus, plus six. of plus six. So pretty gained up on both. This is not a sound stage by any means. There's some ambient sound around here. Let's see what we can hear. My ears can perceive a little bit of machinery noise outside the windows. Maybe a little traffic. It's pretty quiet. This is not a sound stage by any means. There's some ambient sound around here. Let's see what we can hear. My ears can perceive a little bit of machinery noise outside the windows. Maybe a little traffic. It's pretty quiet, pretty quiet. Okay, so now I'm gonna get loud. So this is all of a sudden I, I get animated and I start to talk very loudly and I'm, I'm emphatic and even, I, completely, can you believe it? All right, pretty quiet. Okay, so now I'm gonna get loud. So this is all of a sudden I, I get animated and I start to talk very loudly and I'm, I'm emphatic and even, I, completely, can you believe it? All right. I don't think I uh, am I'm clipping on the G2 at all. Let's see. Am I clipping? What, what all happened, but in my findings, and you know, here we're not listening to, to studio monitors at all, uh, but even in the studio monitors, the difference was very hard to perceive between the two systems, and there was no, none of the what I feared was going to be there, the auto game sound. Now, that was today so for this purpose, and in real world, use up till now, I, there is none. So what had uh, potentially been the biggest downfall for me or pitfall has become one of the biggest benefits. Uh, now I know when I send out a system, be it with one of my guys or with a rental, uh, on a rental, I know that they're going to, the, the person at that end who's using it is going to be able to come back with quality audio. They won't have the issues that I have had in the past even with quality systems. And like you, know, like you saw, my, my systems were the evolution uh, all along, from the big heavy metal uh, series ones through the G2s, and I still have all of them because they'll still work. So uh, 
that was the biggest uh, question for me and the biggest answer. Um, now I'd like to know more about you guys and what your questions are to, so I can tell you about it because I've probably done a lot of, of pretty much anything you need okay, to so do. Go ahead. To my question. Yep. Bride and groom. Business. Yep. You know, they might start a little further away. How does the auto gain? Um, it's not going to. It's yeah, not it's going not. To? It's not going to. So what it seems to me, and, and I'm going to throw out some terms. I'm going to say some things about how it sounds, and then maybe from an engineering standpoint, you can correct me if they're wrong. But what it seems like is that there's just an enormously wide dynamic range of input to the transmitter. And like, these were reduced sensitivity labs. They're not what should be on people speaking or what you would use on a bride and groom, where you'd actually have a lot more latitude. So if you all of a sudden had to, had to gain up because the mic wound up further away, a lot further away, you could theoretically just hit the, the button on the receiver and pop up, scroll through. Not the ideal. I don't think you'll have to. My, my use is not that. It's that I set the level so that I'm hearing good level from normal speaking. And then no microphone's going to, you know, if, if the bride moves 20 feet away, every mic's going to sound the same. This will do the same thing happily, I think, happily, that the G2 system would have done. It, it's basically going to, she's going to drop off. It's not going to gain up and automatically lift her because she's further away. To me, that's a benefit. Uh, so I can do that. I can do it on my pot on the camera. I can do it on the receiver. Uh, I did not want a system that all of a sudden was bringing up further away or ambient noise when there wasn't a direct sound. I wanted a system that was reliable and, and repeatable. So in general, what I do is I set my recorder to the hottest clean point that it'll do. And on a Canon DSLR, again, that's one. It's barely clicked open, because I don't want to introduce any of the artifacting that the DSLR front end has, or noise, the noise issues. Their preamp is, is, is not meant for filmmaking. The camera is. <laughs> or it's very good at it, but not the, the audio. So you open that just one crack and gain everything up. This doesn't seem to have any noise. That was what I was testing in that system today. I was trying to see if I have to gain up both of these systems as, as far as they can go, how do they compare noise-wise? They're the same. They seem the same. Again, I was concerned with, is there going to be a, a, a lot of compression used? Will the codec feel compressed? Will the transmission feel compressed? Because other digital devices do exhibit that behavior. My tests, again, seem like if you can use the analog G2 system, you can use this system. And uh, I thought live music and that kind of environment was going to be one of the places I would keep the G2 system for and have to use it. I am feeling more and more like I don't have to keep the G2 system uh, for, that, for those reasons, that I will keep him uh, for what? For purposes where I may have to do something really finicky and I have a sound guy who's going to monitor and set every, every little bit of that signal chain to make sure we get that. And I still am not 100% sure that that is going to be warranted. In most cases, this system will seem to, to function that way by itself. I, I think, you know, when I, when I heard the, the spiel, I was like, <laughs> bull, bull, bull. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. No way. Um, and, and anytime somebody tells me that kind of thing, I say, OK, great, except all those places where that's not going to work for me. And um, this system certainly gets well along that path to this, to the point that I am comfortable sending it out with people who have very little acoustic knowledge, um, have no idea how to set input sensitivity properly, um, or who come to me and say, I need a, a second system. I'm I need to rent a, an audio system, a second system. I have one. You know, I bought a Sennheiser system. Good, good going, I, you know, <laughs> but now I need two for this event. How do I make sure they're, are they gonna, do I set them to the same frequency so that they'll work together? Well, like, like I said, the, I have these, um, I don't know the name of the model number of it, and I don't know if Sennheiser has mod modifications for the MKE2s like the DPA 4061s or 4060s, but my background is also uh, live theater. I'm a sound designer for, for theater, so I have a long history of doing using Sennheiser 
wireless systems uh, for live performance and live sound. I design and install sound system. And then, uh, so I also have this experience with DPA. So DPA mics are one of the things that I have a whole bunch of. And I have some modifi modifiers, um, which I probably have in here somewhere. It's a, it's a little disc, and it turns the omnidirectional cardioid, uh, or omnidirectional uh, lavalier mic element into a hemispherical pickup. So a couple of those in front of an orchestra is a really fantastic sounding uh, spaced omni style recording, but with the boundary layer effect. So you get a really great high gain, clean, ambient pickup. And then I'll mix that if there's vocals, I'll try and get a, another. So more than two channels means I'm using a recorder. So I will sometimes uh, be using something like you know, Zoom with a couple of those plug-in guys. And so there you go, here it is. I have spaced uh, omni ambient mics here, and then I can have two of those uh, receivers plugged in directly to it. And the transmitters are plugged into outputs from the board. And I've got four channels that I can mix later on. And I'm using scratch audio in the camera, that kind of thing. This system actually helps to address that in a better way than the Evolution did because the real problem comes from the pack. You set your input sensitivity, let's say, to minus 10 for a nice, I want to be able to catch the valves, you know, and they're going to be a little bit quiet and whatever, so minus 10, great. Now, all of a sudden, they're on the dance floor, or whatever's happening, and it's super loud, and people are shouting, and the pack is being overloaded at the pack. You can't do anything unless you go up to the groom and pull him aside and start going into the menus and dialing down the input sensitivity to the pack. That does not exist here as an issue. And it's kind of the miraculous part of this system. <laughs> um, it's the voodoo that makes this system what it is. I think to me, it's, it's the, the biggest benefit because now you don't have to go to the pack. You can't go to the pack. There's nothing to change there. You're going to change it at the receiver. So if you're overloading the camera's input, you just back it off on this with the, that one button. But you're already going to have some control. If you're most typical cameras, you're going to want to be about halfway up on your pot. So you get a lot of room right there on the pot. And the dynamic range is there, it seems, no matter what. Now, it, can you answer the question? Is there a difference in the dynamic range if you're at one or four? No, because the dynamic range is set, uh, as you're saying, on the transmitter itself. So it, all that magical voodoo and everything happens in the transmitter pack. Right. Uh, how we explain the four steps on the meter is that the lowest one is mic level, and the four steps up is line level, and then you have two steps in between. So depending on what type okay. of device you're plugging into, set it either mic or line, or just season the taste, if you will. Definitely. So th this answers the problem. It actually makes your life much easier because you don't have to fix it at the source. You have to fix you fix it at your camera where you already are. That's right. It's great. It's like wireless power focus for audio. Almost. Is is this when you change here, are you, is it sending any information to the pack to change anything there? Not at all. It's just an AF out adjustment on this portion, as far as I understand. I love having an engineer in the room <laughs> who can answer these questions because these are the ones that I, I want to know how it's working. Yeah. Uh, it just means uh, it means to me that the pack is doing the job of the evolution pack at every different input sensitivity level, all at the same time, which is a little bit mind-blowing. And until I did the tests for myself, I didn't believe that it was possible. My majority of, of use is going to be belt pack. Virtually every video that I produce has some talking head in it, some sort of interview, some sort of thing that's not going to be handheld based. That happens sometimes, but for the majority of times, I'm putting these on people. Um, how many people in here are doing event style, running gun, uh, not, let's say, toward the event end of things or documentary end of things versus to the cinematic end where you've got time to, to take, you know, to set up? How many are at the event end? Okay. And at the cinema end? Great. Okay. So at the cinema end, you may well have, you know, your audio guy who may. Uh, a professional audio mixer is probably going to look, who get to know this will probably 
thank you. <laughs> you make me look good. Uh, but you may also be employing some advanced techniques that then want or require you know, going to an analog system. Uh, here's what's great about this. With the analog system, you can get bitten. It's, in cinema, it's not such a big deal, but in event uh, and sometimes documentary, you've got one chance to get it, and, and definitely, you know, weddings. So when you're on an analog system, and it seems like you've got, you've done your frequency scan, you've done your due diligence, yeah, yes, yeah, right? You get there, you do a, do a good scan, you're one of the only people who does. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and then all of a sudden, halfway through the ceremony, you're taking hits on the system. That is one of the biggest fears we live with, uh, with the analog systems, and this doesn't do that. And it's very unlikely I'm going to run into any of the, the few things that are out there device-wise that are a problem. When I've looked at other digital systems, though, uh, I go into professional theaters where they have wireless communication systems. They've got wireless DMX systems. Uh, and they've got two or three Wi-Fi systems. So 2.4 gigahertz to me is a no-go. There's no way I'm buying a 2.4 gig system. 1.9, not a problem. So, so far, here's the bad news. I haven't gotten to experience it having an issue. I say it's the bad news because I want to know <laughs> what it does. I want to know what situation it is that's going to make it happen. I hope I get to experience that, but I, I kind of hope I don't. So theoretically, unless you and I and you, because you just bought two systems and a couple other people, we all wind up in the same room at the same time with these systems. And I do think that that's possible in the ENG world eventually, because I think these are going to catch on like wildfire in that arena. So now you've got 20 camera people who show up to cover an event. That's where they're going to, guys will be popping out Evolution Series, you know, UHF stuff and as a backup. But these will be the primary systems on the cameras, I think, uh, for many reasons. But <laughs> because two of these little receivers go into these ports and don't change any of these cameras at all, fundamentally. They turn on and off with the power. Did you catch all that during the presentation? They turn on and off with the camera. One button, they turn on. <laughs> That's awesome. How many times have we forgotten? Oh, no, we're starting to roll, and yo, we got to go start on the receivers or the transmitters. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this antenna, I'm in love with this thing. Uh, I've got a couple of them, of the evolutions, that I've had for quite a while. And, oh, this is my favorite. Right here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, th this took a long time to happen, all right? And it's been working like this for years, a couple more years since, since it happened. But that's not going to happen here. So it's also kind of amazing to me. This was such a blessing in terms of size and weight from the G1 series, the big heavy ones with the 9 volts, and the double A's were a great benefit. The lithium ion and the further reduction in size and the antenna being integrated and not being you know, a loose piece. Everything about it is an upgrade to me. Everything about it is, a, is an evolution over this series. Um, I love that. And I still love this. I, I do. I'll keep it on a shelf. It'll, it'll. <laughs> <laughs> um, the handheld being shipping with the Omni capsule, fantastic. Uh, the, the button, on off button being sort of a recess thing that you have to reach in and, and pull up on, fantastic. I don't see any way to inadvertently do anything to this. And again, you know, nice, uh, it feels very robust. Um, the battery replacing very quick and spare in my pack, um, as opposed to any kind of built-in battery. And the Omni capsule sounds great. It's for video, it's fantastic. Um, don't think that unless I needed to also send that signal to some sort of live uh, speaker system that I would opt for a different capsule for most of the, the video pickup that we're doing. And it is great, especially, you know, <laughs> for untrained, you know, this kind of thing. Because there's no noise, too. Because you can gain up at the, at the camera and not introduce a noise floor. Not that I've been able to do. 
there's no noise floor there unless your camera is introducing the noise floor. We yeah. drop test everything, and we have a lab where they just repeatedly break, try to break it. And exactly. that's what, yeah. And is it, did I do it right? Yeah. You can replace the capsule. It's like 12 or 14 different capsules you can screw on. Any Evolution or 2000 series will fit right on there. And I expect the drop testing you know, here is, is that this will still work long after you've destroyed a capsule. Yeah, absolutely. And so the capsule is the cheaper way, cheaper way to replace something. I liked very much that it was a um, modular system. Uh, power, I think you mentioned it's up to 250 milliwatt right. and it's dynamic. So that to me was one of the key selling features. A lot of the other systems are set to 25, 50, 100 milliwatts. 250 milliwatt is the by far the, the most powerful and battery life at, on those systems when they're set to 250 milliwatts is very short. So this being dynamic in terms of allocating that power was a big uh, benefit. I have not yet been able to find that point where it has dropped off from distance. I've done some tests, I did some second floor shooting and uh, out across a parking lot, uh, indoor and outdoor things, I haven't found it yet. So it more than covers standard video coverage ranges for me, for events, for shooting in uh, even large theater rooms and things like that. I haven't found any, any issue there. Whether or not it's, it, you know, I, don't, I have no idea how high it's gaining up. Uh, I know that in a similar theater, or in the same theater, they have some uh, 50 milliwatt transmitters in use and that those cover the distance well. So I would expect that it's not having to compete it's not competing with anything in the room, but I'd expect it's not having to push much harder than that. Uh, capsules, I wanted to talk about the two different, if you're making a choice at some point um, between the system with the ME2 and the MKE2, there's a couple of things I have found uh, as ways to make that choice to me. All right, so this is an MKE2 package, and the capsule that's inside it, if you haven't seen one, is, uh, is naked. It's got a little hole in the top, and there are two caps in here, at least two, uh, that come with it, a standard response and then a high-frequency boost. The high-frequency boost is if you're going to mount this, this capsule beneath clothing to make up for the loss of the material that it's going through and the, the standard capsule is there. Standard cap, uh, frequency response cap. And then there's a wind, a little wind jammer dome, I believe, the metal basket, is that in there? Yeah, it, is. it should be. Uh, which is a very good general light outdoor use uh, dome and is very effective at minimizing the, the small noise. And then it also ships with uh, a dead mouse. <laughs> so that's what we call it, right? Uh, and it's a, it's a very effective one. So uh, the fact that it, all of that is in the package is great. It's also the reason not to buy that system if you are a certain shooter or giving it to certain people. I'm not giving that system out on a rental, unless it's to a cinematographer, OK? I'm not giving it out on a rental or sending it to an event. The ME2. Uh, on the other hand, was quite a pleasant surprise in that it came in and was a slight modification and upgrade from a previous ME2 that I had seen. It came in and it looked like this and had uh, a little basket on it and I immediately well, I looked and said, that looks different, but I immediately tried to pull the basket off and it doesn't come off, it's all integrated. This makes it foolproof. Uh, in a big way. And it, the only extra feature is a little foam dome for heavier wind, which are generally, to me, a little ineffectual. They, they're, they're a, you know, if it's getting too much wind noise, put the foam on it. But this is great, because now there's, no, there's nothing to go wrong. Nobody's picking the wrong capsule uh, cap. Nobody is forgetting to put on this little wind guy when they should. And they're not losing it, because it's not detachable. So this goes out for general event use. This goes out with rentals for people who don't know as much as I know about what they're doing. Can that go behind clothing? 
it can. I've done it, you know, in a pinch. And then you have to do some EQ in post, and uh, it sounds awfully good. The difference between the two mics is there if you're doing the equivalent of pixel peeping for, for photography, if you're really sitting there in front of some great monitors, or if you need to EQ. That it's kind of like when you're shooting, and if you need to color process, you need to have much more perfect uh, and, and, and wider range when you're shooting, so you might shoot raw so that you can process better. I, I would say that the MKE2 gives you that extra range and clarity, and if you need to EQ it, you're going to be able to do it without having it turn crunchy or anything. The ME2 is a fantastic general use, inexpensive mic. I also, I'm not going to cry if somebody loses or breaks this. Um, replacing this is much more uh, economical. But I'm not going to hand this to a cinematographer. The, or somebody with a dedicated sound person who's going to make choices about mounting and, and do things that are more advanced than uh, needing to run in, clip on to a, a subject and go. All right, general use, great general use mic. It's also, have you seen the uh, uh, clip mic digital from Sennheiser and Apogee too? Check it out. It's a, it's one of these. Or the MKE2 digital is a Mickey 2 that has a lightning connector, goes into the iPhone. Uh, now it sits in my, my camera bag as an emergency backup because you can throw an iPhone on somebody and record from this in up to 24-bit 96K resolution. And so I've been in situations where I've been one wireless system short and just like, oh, you have another person who wants to be on camera. Okay, great. That's I clip on another mic. Sounds exactly the same and uh, is a great emergency backup thing. So check that out. It's awesome. Anything else? Thoughts? Hi. Hi. Welcome. You're late to the game, but that's OK. <laughs> you can offer new, new perspective. What's the question? It's probably something you already answered. <laughs> probably. At Evolution 100? Yeah. Works with the same system? No. Same channels? No. 1.9 gigahertz instead of the UHF band. So completely separate, not competing with virtually anything else that's out there. So up to eight, eight of the AVX systems can coexist in, inside the radius of the AVX system. So inside of a building, you might be able to do a whole bunch more depending on if they're far enough away from each other. But if, uh, if you're, what kind of style of shooting are you? ENG, event? Event. Uh, event, okay. So it's unlikely in most event situations you're gonna show up and be there with more than eight other people trying to use an AVX system, because they'd all have to be that. Otherwise, the, the, you're not gonna compete with anything and you're not gonna configure anything. There is no, um, nothing to configure. There's no channel to choose. You turn it on, pair it to the receiver, and you're done. And you only pair it the first time, then you're, you're done. It does everything, and you don't see it, you don't experience it. Uh, it's already broadcasting on two channels simultaneously, so if one gets interference, it automatically flips to the other before you sense it. And then if that gets one, it shifts the next one. It, it'll just keep bouncing frequency, it's frequency hopping. The phantom power is, uh, as Ben was saying, very low. Um, uh, very low amperage. Very low amperage, yeah. Yeah, low current. So it doesn't, it just takes a small resistor probably to, to stop that. Yeah. Uh, and it just uses it to sense if it's there. And when it does sense it, it will automatically turn on. If it doesn't, and you need to use it with a DSLR, uh, then you just push and hold the power button for, it's on. It's on. oh, there, it's on. So you push and hold for a couple seconds, and it'll come on and stay on until you push and hold to get it to turn off. If you hit the red on a lot of camcorders, you've got the ability to engage a limiter. And so somewhere prior to the red or at the red, it'll engage the limiter. Some of the camcorders have a brick wall limiter and some have a soft knee and some you can choose that. So it all depends on your camcorder. Uh, this particular one, I try not to hit the red because it does have a compressor. I can hear it's a safety. I have it on so that if somebody untrained is using it, I know they're not going to give me distorted audio because I can't stand distorted audio. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the thing that'll make me pull, pull out all this hair is I, I, I get something back and they'll say, I don't know, it sounded good in the headphones. I'm like, no, it didn't. What are you talking about? This is, this is terrible. And I understand, in headphones, you don't often 
um, a lot of times, unless you're really truly monitoring, and that's where a second audio person comes in, they're just they're doing one thing, seriously monitoring with really good headphones that are isolating the natural sound from the from what's being shot into their ears, and they can tell, and that's their job, and that's good. Uh, but a lot of times that's not the case, and you're using less than ideal. Um, or less than less expensive headphones to monitor the audio as you're shooting it. So sometimes things sneak by, and now I'm much more confident that the people who aren't able to be that critical, from lack of experience or just lack of knowledge, um, will still come back with really good audio. Yeah. Well, that's mm. the beauty of it is if you take the battery out or it goes dead or you swap batteries, it, it comes right back to where you left off. For, right if it if it was left on, it'll turn right back on and vice versa. So yeah. it remembers everything, it remembers your gain settings every time. You don't have to change it every time, just make sure it's good. And as we were saying earlier, if you have a really long shoot, you could just hook up a battery pack or USB battery pack right to the receiver and power it as long as you want. Those big batteries will power it for days, no problem. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.